give a big round welcome to my brother, electrical contractor, also pretty good speaker, Terry Clark in the house. Amen. Have you had a good day at church? Have you felt like you you've been in the country? In the truck. In the truck. Come on. We pray in the truck here. Anything else? We pray in the truck. Come on. Go get them. Go get them. Okay, good. Hey, hey, nice. Thank you, buddy. I had two different messages, and uh, your preacher said, no, just do one. You pick the one that you like, you think the folk will like. So uh, we're doing one. Now, mo most of y'all don't know me, and I'm seven years his senior. I'm four of six children. I'm the number four. So, uh, and most of you that know me, I tell folk that I have a white Porsche. And I do, and she's sitting right over there. She came with me. So, that is my wife, Porsche. I have a white Porsche. There's nothing wrong with that. That's, that's just what I have, so that's the way it is. Oh, well, I'm glad to be here. I'm happy to be here. And before I get started, I have two questions to ask you. Not wearing my glasses, I feel these. I've got them. I've got them. But I have two questions. Why are you here? That's number one. The second one is, why am I here? Has nothing to do about what we're going to talk about. Nothing. Okay? But people on a plane and people in a pew have a lot in common. All are on a journey. Most are well-behaved and presentable. A few are giggly and some are cranky. Some doze. But most are content to enjoy a predictable experience. Well, I hope today for you this is not predictable. And it might be a little bit different. And I hope that that's going to be okay with you because my Savior was a whole lot different. Okay? So if we go different, that's okay but we'll all wind up at the cross. Is that all right? That's what we'll do. That's what we'll do. Most people are content just to have a nice service or a nice flight. Nice flight, Captain. Thank you. Nice service, preacher. Thank you. Hmm. But Jesus said in Luke eleven nine, 9, Seek and ye shall find. Many come seeking nice, and guess what they find? nice what have you come seeking today have you come seeking nice hmm a few people aren't content with nice but my desire for you today and for me is to leave this place better than we came that's my desire for y'all and for me that I might get a little closer to my Savior and to the cross of Calvary I hope I can be a little bit closer when I leave here. And I'll tell you, with this service today, if you're not really careful, it might happen, okay? It might just happen. So why am I here? That's why you're here. Why am I here? Well, number one, your preacher asked me to come. And usually when I come, I have a little story. Sometimes they're tough for me. But Danny wakes up the day after Christmas. His jaws are sore. Oh. And then he remembers why his mouth is hurting. It's because he smiles so much the day before on Christmas. And the reason he smiles so much the day before Christmas is that, that his older brother gave him a brand new red Chevrolet Camaro. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? He gave me my dream car. It's sitting out. Oh, it's sitting out. I'm going to go to the window and look. There is some homeless person standing there next to my car. Well, that ain't going to fly. That ain't going to work. So I'm going to step outside. Hey! What are you doing? 
How you doing? I'm just looking at this pretty car. Oh, okay. Well, look, I really don't want you messing with it. This is my car. My brother gave me this car for Christmas. This guy's standing there in rags. He said, you didn't have to pay anything for this car? He said, no. He said, boy, I sure wish that... And then his head dropped. And Danny knew that he was going to say, I sure wish I had a brother like that, but he didn't. And what he said, with tears in his eyes, he said, you know, I wish I could be a brother like that. So that's why I'm here. I want to be a brother like that. That's why I'm here. That's why I come. I want to be a brother like that, okay? Whew. Boy, it gets easier for me now, okay? <laughs> hey, I have one verse of Scripture I want us to read. Psalm 139, 14, I'll tell us when to stop. This whole thing is about divine design. Why I'm made the way I'm made. Why you're made the way you're made. Why? It is not random. There's nothing on this planet random. Everything is following an order. I mean down to the T. Period. I don't care who you are, what denomination you are. God is running it all. You can argue all day long. He runs it all. Flat out. That's, where, that's the camp I'm in. And it's by divine design. That's where we are. Psalm 139, 14. Can we read this? I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Stop. Now, how am I made? Fearfully and what? Is that odd to you? Or is it just me? I said in the earlier meeting that it's kind of like a mustard and apple jelly sandwich. Fearfully and wonderfully. Do you know anyone that's wonderfully made? I do. Do you know anyone that's fearfully made? Hmm. Do they go together? Why isn't it wonderfully and superbly made? No, it's fearfully and wonderfully made. And that's not really what I'm going to talk to you about, but I'd just like you to keep that in your noodle. Father, I ask you to help me right now, just to speak in love to these dear folk and in the authority of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Each of us are created unique with our own abilities and disabilities. Okay? Each of us matter, and we are purpose-driven. We are who we are by how divine design. That's who we are. And I'm going to speak to you from 1 Samuel 17, if you want to go in through and read this story that you already know, but you don't already know what you're going to about to hear. Totally, totally different than you've ever heard this story. And there's no better example in the book of how God created two very different individuals to accomplish whose will? Is it our will? Is it your will? Whose will is it? What if it don't go to my plan? What do I do? Well, then we focus on the planner, not the plan. Why don't we just look to the planner? Let him do it. And then all we got to do is follow the planner. Because he won't fail. He's faithful. God, he can't be unfaithful. He's faithful. That's who he is. So let's just follow the planner, not the plan. Okay? That's where we're at. And this is probably the most taught children's Bible story. And everything that I thought I knew about this story was wrong. I didn't know it. I thought I knew it. I thought everybody knew that, what I knew. I didn't know more. 
Today we're going to talk about giants and improbable victories. An improbable victory. And you know of some things that's happened in your, your life, right? Has any of y'all ever fought a giant in your life? You either have or you haven't. 1993 was a giant year for me. I wed my beautiful bride in 93. My mother was murdered in 1993. Is that a giant? Can I see the hands of people whose mother was murdered? That's a giant. That's a giant. I couldn't even say the phrase, my mama's murdered. It wouldn't come out. Is that a giant? That's a giant. Wow. But today, it's been a blessing. It's been a blessing. I didn't have to endure years of watching my mother. And this sounds so selfish. But I didn't have to endure the years of my mom like my wife did with her mother and watch her mother waste away. In just one breath, my mama's with Jesus Christ. She's gone. She's home. Instead of going every day and every day and every day. And that's not the only blessing. There's been so many blessings because of your preacher. So many people have come to know Jesus Christ through his ministry and from hearing how our mother made it. It's been a blessing, folks. It's been a blessing. But at the time, it was a giant for this boy. It whipped my tail. Wow, I was a whip puppy. And we do know that all things work together good, or do they work together for good? They work together for good. It may not be good for you. It may be great for me. What happened? It may be bad for you. It may be bad for me. It may be great for you. Because we don't know how God puts all this together. And you know what? We don't have to know. Who do we need to follow is the planner, not the plan. So that's the camp we're in, folks. Divine design. Remember now, I want you to see everything that happens in this story that actually happened, and it's recorded in the book, 3,000 years ago. When the kingdom of Israel is in its infancy. Now, in ancient Palestine, along the eastern border, there are mountains up there. And it has Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron. And if you go west, you come to the Mediterranean, there's a coastal plain there. So we've got the mountains here and the coastal plain with Tel Aviv next to the ocean. But there's an area in the middle between the coastal plain, between the coastal plain and the mountain region, and it's called the Shephala. Can y'all say that? Shephala. It's the Shephala. And the Shephala is a series of ridges and valleys separating the mountains from the coastal plain. Are we there? This is the Shephala. How many of you knew what the Shephala was? Not many. Good, good, we learned something. And it's probably the most beautiful place in all of Israel with forest of oak, wheat fields, vineyards. But in this time, it serves a strategic function. It separates the mountains from the coastal plain. And hostile armies that want to get up to the mountains, guess where they have to go through? The Shephala. They have to go through it. There's no way around it. That's exactly what happened 3,000 years ago. The Philistines, they're the arch enemies of the kingdom of Israel. They're living in the coastal plain. Why? They're a seafaring people. They're from Crete, the largest of the Greek islands. That's where they came from. So they live near the water. That's who the Philistines are.
they organize their army and they start a campaign into the Shephelah because they want to get up there right beside of Bethlehem, split the kingdom of Israel. They start down into the Shephelah. Now King Saul, who heads up the kingdom of Israel, he gets wind of this. They're what? They're what? They're in the where? They're in the Shephelah. So he gets his army together. He starts coming down the mountain. He enters the Shephelah, and he confronts the Philistines in the most beautiful valley of the Shephelah. And it's the valley of Elah. So here they are. You've got the Philistine army on this ridge, and you've got the Israel army on this ridge. And ain't nothing happening. They just stop. They sat there for 40 days, weeks, taunting each other. They're looking at the fires at night. They can see the tents at night. And they're jeering at each other. And nothing is going on. The Bible says 40 days. Nothing's happening. Why is nothing happening? Hmm. They're in a deadlock. But for either one to attack the other, they've got to come down their ridge through the valley floor and go up the other ridge to attack. And guys, are we going to do that? We're not going to do that. We're not going to fight uphill, right? So they just sit there looking at each other. Nothing's going on. Hmm. So finally, to break the deadlock, the Philistines send out their mightiest warrior down onto the floor. This guy's a giant. He calls out to the Israel army, Hey! Send your mightiest warrior down here. Let him come to me. I'll feed his flesh to the birds of the air, the beast of the field. Come to me! We'll have it out one-on-one. -on -one. And that was very common in that day, called single combat, without incurring the bloodshed of a major battle. And if we win, you serve us. If you win, we serve you. So that's what's going on right now. He's down in the bottom hollering at the Israel army. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. He's outfitted in brass armor, head to toe, a sword, a spear, a knife, a shield. He's terrifying. He's so terrifying not one Israel soldier will fight him. Would you think that that's by design? Do you think maybe God had a hand in that? I mean, if he was brought up where we at, these people down in Rockingham say, absolutely, I'll go to it. I don't care how big he is. Do y'all see God working in this? He doesn't let anybody else go out of that whole army. No, you're not going. That makes no sense. That's a little bit weird. But you can see God working in that. See, I think that's great. I think that's wonderful. He's so terrified, none of them will fight him. It's a death wish. And finally, the only person to come forward is a shepherd boy. Tells the king, I'll fight him. Have you bumped your head? Are you out of your mind? You can't fight this guy. Did you see him? Did you look down there in the valley and look at this guy? You can't, no, you can't fight, you can't fight this guy. Saul argues with him, but this kid is adamant. No, I can take him. I got my sling. I can take him. Are you kidding? I can hit wolves on the run along the tree line. It's 60 yards. I can take him. Saul has no option. No one else will put their hand up. Okay, I'm going to let you go. But here, you got to use my armor. Let me put my heavy armor on you to go fight this giant. And let me give you my help. He said, I can't. No. I can't wear this. I can't use this. I'm a shepherd. 
The Bible says I can't do it because I've not proved it. I've never worn it. King Saul relents, gives in to the lad. So the shepherd boy leaves. He said, well, Lord be with you. you know, Good luck. Starts down the hill, and the giant's down there waiting on him. He's waiting. He walks down the hill. He bends over, and he happens to see five stones right there. And they just are shining. He picks them up, puts them in his sack, his shepherd's bag. Okay? They all have one. And he continues toward the giant. Now the giant's standing there, and he sees a figure coming down. Not quite sure what's happening, but he sees something. He screams to him, come to me! Come to me! So I can feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Come to me! Let's get this on. And the shepherd draws closer. And the giant looks at him. He says, am I a dog that you'd bring sticks? Insulted him. I mean, he's ranting at him. David takes one of those stones. The shepherd boy puts it in his sling. He starts moving it around just a little bit, whirling it around, whirling it around, whirling it around, whirling it around. Let's it Boom! <laughs> He's either dead or unconscious. One or the other. He's on the ground. So David runs. The Bible says he got on him, on him, and took his own sword and cut his head off. Now, what do you think the Philistine army's doing right now? <laughs> they are gone. This is the best guy they had. He's it. He's top dog. And now he's headless. With a little boy? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Is God working this or no? Is God doing this? How do you not see divine design in what's happening in this valley of Elah? It is crazy. He falls dead or unconscious, and now he's headless. The Philistine army runs. And the name of the giant is? And the name of the shepherd is? And in this story, y'all tell me who is the underdog? Who's the underdog here? Who? David's the underdog. Is he? <laughs> oh my gosh. Why do we call David an underdog? Well, number one, David is a kid, and Goliath is a big, strong giant, and David is a shepherd, and Goliath is a big, mighty warrior, and David has a sling, and Goliath has all this modern weaponry. And we say, well, all David has is his sling. Well, that's the first mistake we make. That's the first mistake we make in thinking that David is the underdog. In ancient warfare, there are three kinds of warriors. Cavalry, that's men on horseback with chariots. There's heavy infantry, which is sword, shields, and armor. And guess where Goliath would fall? Under heavy infantry. That's who he is. And there's also artillery, which is bow and arrows, but more importantly here, are slingers. A slinger. In the Hebrew, an experienced slinger is called kalal. Kalal. And it was interesting to me that L-A-W is in there. The law is coming. We better do something. The law is coming. They're slingers. A slinger has a leather pouch with two long cords. He puts a stone or a lead ball in it. 
whirls it around, lets it fly. Now, David's weapon is not a child's toy. It's not a slingshot. It's a devastating weapon. When David spins that sling six to seven revolutions and lets it go, that's like a golfer on the number one tee hitting that ball. Could you get out of the way of a driving golf ball? I couldn't. That's incredibly fast. I never knew that. I didn't know that about a slinger being a kalal. That's an experienced slinger. Now, what he's slinging, the stones in the Valley of Elah, that's not a regular rock that you're going to go out in the parking lot and pick up. No, it's barium sulfate stone. It's twice the density of a normal stone. And if you run the ballistics of a kala with a barium stone, it's equivalent to a 45 caliber handgun. This is devastating weapon that he possesses. And he's a kala. That's all he does all day with the sheep. There's thousands of rocks everywhere. What do you think he's doing out there? He's not on his phone. No, he's slinging all day. It's what he does. Man, he can hit a wolf on the run. And now you have this lumbering giant with 150 pounds of armor all over him in the hot Palestinian sun. The guy's a sitting duck. He doesn't have a chance. This giant doesn't have a chance. Not with David. He's a kalal. And he has five chances. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh my God. David has every expectation of hitting that lumbering giant right between the eyes. He can't miss. He's quite close to this giant. As far as accuracy, historical records reveal that there are lethal results up to 200 yards with a claw, not just a sling, but a claw. 200 yards, that's two football fields. You hit something. From medieval tapestries, the claw could hit birds in flight. They're on tapestries today, you can see them. They're knocking birds out of the sky. Are they accurate? Unbelievably accurate. When David lined up against Goliath, he had every intention of hitting him right there. Every intention. He couldn't miss. Time after time in historical warfare, the Kalal was the deciding factor in heavy infantry conflicts. Not archers, the Kalal with slings. Now, who's the underdog? Goliath is heavy infantry, and he says, come to me. He expects to fight how? Hand to hand. He wants to get his hands on this little runt, this sling and a cord. He wants to grab hold to him. And King Saul thought that. He told him, here, take my armor. If you're going to fight him, he thought he was going to fight him hand to hand. No! David has no intention of doing that. Why would he? He's a claw. He spent his whole career guarding sheep from lions and wolves. Why am I going to wear armor? So David faces this giant. It's crazy. And the giant doesn't have a chance. The second part of this. A lot of times the giants in our life may not be what they seem given time, given the right resources, that giant may not be what you think it is. That phone call may wind up three years down the road being the biggest blessing of your life. See, we don't know that. We don't know how we fit into whose plan, his plan. But all things do work together for good 
to them that love God. We know that. We know that. The second part. The scripture tells us in hints that maybe this giant isn't all that he seems to be. Number one, Goliath is led into the valley floor by an attendant. Why? It's the best man they got. Why is he being led onto the valley floor? That's odd to me. It doesn't mention David being led down to the valley floor. Just Goliath. Isn't that odd to you? That's weird to me. If he's the best guy, he shouldn't need an attendant. Well, that's the way I think. And the Bible makes mention of how he moves slowly with an attendant. And also, how does Goliath react to David coming down that ridge? He doesn't see any shining armor. He's not going to be fighting another infantry battle. But it's like he's oblivious or he doesn't recognize what's going on. Why? That's weird. And Goliath says, am I a dog that you'd come to me with sticks? Sticks? David had one stick. It was a shepherd's staff. Sticks? No. There was a whole lot of speculation in the medical community about this very scenario that happened. Whether there could have been an issue with Goliath. Was he big? Yeah, without a doubt. Was he strong? Unbelievably. Yeah. Huge, huge, huge guy. Warrior. But in 1960, Indiana Medical Journal released speculation on his height. Six cubits and a span. And a cubit's from the elbow to the tip of the middle finger. That's a cubit. There. And a span is from the thumb to the end of the little finger. So he's six cubits and a span. That's over nine feet. That's craziness. That's craziness. They released speculation about Goliath's height. The most common form of giantism is called acromegaly. Could very well be that he had acromegaly because of how he reacted and how he moved and with his vision. Watch this. Acromegaly is caused by a benign tumor on the pituitary gland and it causes excessive growth hormone. Robert Wadlow was 8 feet 11 when he died at 24. He's in the Guinness Book. He was 24, 24 years old when he died at 8 foot 11. He wore glasses that looked like Coke bottles because he had acromegaly. He didn't walk well. Why? Because he had acromegaly. His coordination wasn't well. How about Andre the Giant? Do y'all remember Andre the Giant? Did any of you ever see him in the, in, the, in the ring? How he moved? He was great if he get his hands on you. But as far as moving, he suffered in his coordination. How hard would that be to walk down a mountain to fight a little boy with a sling if you have acromegaly? Would you need an attendant? I probably would. Could very well be that's the situation. Abraham Lincoln, acromegaly. Acromegaly comes with a very distinct set of side effects. It, poor agility, a lack of coordination because your bones grow so fast. It just doesn't work well. You can be a little bit clumsy, sort of like your preacher. I'm just saying, I'm just saying you can be, okay? Another side effect is poor vision as the tumor grows. It will press on the visual nerves and you just don't see well. Sticks? No, he had one stick. Goliath may have seen several. There's no telling. He only had one stick. Come to me so I can fight you here because I don't see you that well. I don't move that well. 
But buddy, if I get my hands on you, forget about it. I just got to get you right here so I can fight you here. And see, that's interesting to me. That is interesting to me. Come to me because I can't see you very well. Now the Israelites that are looking down on Goliath thought this giant was a terrifying, frightening foe. But they didn't understand that the apparent source of his greatest strength was also the source of his greatest weakness. And in that, there is a lesson for us. Giants aren't always what they seem to be. My 1993 wasn't what it seemed to be. Not today. Wasn't what it seemed to be. And I would encourage you that when you are confronted with a giant, and by the way, you will be, just take the time. Lean on the Lord and look in your little bag of blessing. And you might just find a giant killer. Praise the Lord. Wasn't that good? Wasn't that good? So it shouldn't be called David and Goliath. It should be called Goliath and David. How many looking back on your life, you thought, you thought that it was David and Goliath in the situation you faced. But looking back now, it was really Goliath and David. It was, it was... God was with me. Amen. How many had something horrible in your life? It was the hardest thing you ever went through in your life. Can I see your hand? It just it killed me. I've got mine. It just killed me. I got a couple of them. Fellowship meets every Sunday morning on our beautiful 15 and a half acre campus in the Bullseye of Rotunda, West Florida, at 140 Rotunda Boulevard West. Early worship begins at 8.30 a.m., with our morning worship service beginning at 10.30 a.m. Between these two services, we offer gourmet coffee, fresh juices, pastries, and lots of fellowship free of charge in our hospitality center. If you are looking for a church in the Inglewood area or would just like to pay us a visit, we would love to fellowship with you. For more information, give us a call at 941-475-7447 or log on to fcinglewood.com. For Pastor Gary Clark and all of us at Fellowship, God bless you.